Airplanes come in many different shapes and sizes depending on the mission of the aircraft, but all modern airplanes have certain components in common. These are the fuselage, wing, tail assembly and control surfaces, landing gear and power plants. For any airplane to fly, it must be able to lift the weight of the airplane, its fuel, the passengers and the cargo. The wings generate most of the lift to hold the plane in the air. To generate lift, the airplane must be pushed through the air. The engines, which are usually located beneath the wings, provide the thrust to push the airplane forward through the air. The fuselage is the body of the airplane that holds all the pieces of the aircraft together and many of the other large components are attached to it. The fuselage is generally streamlined as much as possible to reduce drag. Designs for fuselages vary widely. The fuselage houses the cockpit where the pilot and flight crew sit and it provides areas for passengers and cargo. It may also carry armaments of various sorts. Some aircraft carry fuel in the fuselage, others carry the fuel in the wings. In addition, an engine may be housed in the fuselage. The wing provides the principal lifting force of an airplane. Lift is obtained from the dynamic action of the wing with respect to the air. The cross-sectional shape of the wing as viewed from the side is known as the airfoil section. The planform shape of the wing, the shape of the wing as viewed from above and placement of the wing on the fuselage including the angle of incidence. As well as the airfoil section shape, depending upon the airplane mission and the best compromise necessary in the overall airplane design. The control surfaces include all those moving surfaces of an airplane used for attitude, lift, and drag control. They include the tail assembly, the structures at the rear of the airplane that serves to control and maneuver the aircraft, and structures forming part of and attached to the wing. The tail usually has a fixed horizontal piece called the horizontal stabilizer and a fixed vertical piece called the vertical stabilizer. The stabilizers provide stability for the aircraft to keep it flying straight. The vertical stabilizer keeps the nose of the plane from swinging from side to side called yaw, while the horizontal stabilizer prevents an up and down motion of the nose called pitch. On the Wright Brothers' first successful aircraft, the horizontal stabilizer was placed in front of the wings. Such a configuration is called a canard after the French word for duck. The hinge part found on the trailing edge of the wing is called the aileron. It is used to roll the wings from side to side. Flaps are hinged or pivoted parts of the leading and or trailing edges of the wing used to increase lift at reduced air speeds, primarily at landing and takeoff. Spoilers are devices used to disrupt the airflow over the wing so as to reduce the lift on an airplane wing quickly. By operating independently on each wing, they may provide an alternate form of roll control. Slats at the front part of the wing are used at takeoff and landing to produce additional lift. At the rear of both the aileron surfaces and elevators and rudders are small moving sections called trim tabs that are attached by hinges. Their function is to one balance the airplane if it is too nose heavy tail heavy, or wing heavy to fly in a stable cruise condition to maintain the elevator, rudder, and ailerons at whatever setting the pilot wishes without the pilot maintaining pressure on the controls and three help move the elevators, rudder, and ailerons and thus relieve the pilot of the effort necessary to move the surfaces. The landing gear or undercarriage supports the airplane when it is resting on the ground or in water and during the takeoff and landing. The gear may be fixed or retractable. The wheels of most airplanes are attached to shock absorbing struts that use oil or air to cushion the blow of landing. Special types of landing gear include skis for snow and floats for water. For carry landings, arrestor hooks are used. Forward motion or thrust is generated by a thrust producing device or power plant to sustain flight. The power plant consists of the engine and propeller, if present, and the related accessories. The main engine types are the reciprocating or piston type and the reaction or jet engines such as the ramjet, pulse jet, turbojet, turboprop, and rocket engine. The propeller converts the energy of a reciprocating engine's rotating crankshaft into a thrust force. Usually the engines are located in cowl pods hung beneath the wings, but some aircraft, like fighter aircraft, will have the engines buried in the fuselage. Other configurations have sometimes been used. For instance, the Wright Brothers 1903 flyer had pusher propellers propellers at the rear of the plane and the elevators at the front of the aircraft. 
Many fighter aircraft also combine the horizontal stabilizer and elevator into a single stabilator surface. There are many possible aircraft configurations, but any configuration must provide for the four forces needed for flight. An airplane, also called aeroplane or plane, is any of a class of fixed-wing aircraft that is heavier than air, propelled by a screw propeller or a high-velocity jet, and supported by the dynamic reaction of the air against its wings. For an account of the development of the airplane and the advent of civil aviation see the history of flight. The essential components of an airplane are a wing system to sustain it in flight. Tail surfaces to stabilize the wings, movable surfaces to control the attitude of the plane in flight, and a power plant to provide the thrust necessary to push the vehicle through the air. Provision must be made to support the plane when it is at rest on the ground and during takeoff and landing. Most planes feature an enclosed body fuselage to house the crew, passengers, and cargo the cockpit is the area from which the pilot operates the controls and instruments to fly the plane. Principles of aircraft flight and operation aerodynamics an aircraft in straight and level and accelerated flight has four forces acting on it. In turning, diving, or climbing flight, additional forces come into play. These forces are lift, an upward acting force drag, a retarding force of the resistance to lift and to the friction of the aircraft moving through the air weight. The downward effect that gravity has on the aircraft and thrust. The forward acting force provided by the propulsion system or, in the case of unpowered aircraft, by using gravity to translate altitude into speed. Drag and weight are elements inherent in any object, including an aircraft. Lift and thrust are artificially created elements devised to enable an aircraft to fly. Understanding lift first requires an understanding of an airfoil, which is a structure designed to obtain a reaction upon its surface from the air through which it moves. Early airfoils typically had little more than a slightly curved upper surface and a flat undersurface. Over the years, airfoils have been adapted to meet changing needs. By the 1920s, airfoils typically had a rounded upper surface, with the greatest height being reached in the first third of the cord width. In time, both upper and lower surfaces were curved to a greater or lesser degree, and the thickest part of the airfoil gradually moved backward. As airspeeds grew, there was a requirement for a very smooth passage of air over the surface, which was achieved in the laminar flow airfoil, where the camber was farther back than contemporary practice dictated. Supersonic aircraft required even more drastic changes in airfoil shapes, some losing the roundness formerly associated with the wing and having a double wedge shape. By moving forward in the air, the wing's airfoil obtains a reaction useful for flight from the air passing over its surface. In flight, the airfoil of the wing normally produces the greatest amount of lift, but propellers, tail surfaces, and the fuselage also function as airfoils and generate varying amounts of lift. In the 18th century, the Swiss mathematician Daniel Bernoulli discovered that if the velocity of air is increased over a certain point of an airfoil, the pressure of the air is decreased. Air flowing over the curved top surface of the wing's airfoil moves faster than the air flowing on the bottom surface, decreasing the pressure on top. The higher pressure from below pushes lifts the wing up to the lower pressure area. Simultaneously, the air flowing along the underside of the wing is deflected downward, providing a Newtonian equal and opposite reaction and contributing to the total lift. The lift an airfoil generates is also affected by its angle of attacking. E. Its angle relative to the wind. Both lift and angle of attack can be immediately, if crudely, demonstrated by holding one's hand out the window of a moving automobile. When the hand is turned flat to the wind, much resistance is felt and little lift is generated, for there is a turbulent region behind the hand. The ratio of lift to drag is low. When the hand is held parallel to the wind, there is far less drag and a moderate amount of lift is generated, the turbulence smooths out, and there is a better ratio of lift to drag. However, if the hand is turned slightly so that its forward edge is raised to a higher angle of attack, the generation of lift will increase. This favorable increase in the lift to drag ratio will create a tendency for the hand to fly up and over. The greater the speed, the greater the lift and drag will be. Thus, the total lift is related to the shape of the airfoil, the angle of attack, and the speed with which the wing passes through the air. Weight is a force that acts opposite to lift. Designers thus attempt to make the aircraft as light as possible. 
Because all aircraft designs have a tendency to increase in weight during the development process. Modern aerospace engineering staffs have specialists in the field controlling weight from the beginning of the design. In addition, pilots must control the total weight that an aircraft is permitted to carry in passengers' fuel and freight both in amount and location. The distribution of weight I. E. The control of the center of gravity of the aircraft is as important aerodynamically as the amount of weight being carried. Thrust, the forward acting force, is opposed to drag as lift is opposed to weight. Thrust is obtained by accelerating a mass of ambient air to a velocity greater than the speed of the aircraft the equal and opposite reaction is for the aircraft to move forward. In reciprocating or turboprop-powered aircraft, thrust derives from the propulsive force caused by the rotation of the propeller, with residual thrust provided by the exhaust. In a jet engine, thrust derives from the propulsive force of the rotating blades of a turbine compressing air, which is then expanded by the combustion of introduced fuel and exhausted from the engine. In a rocket-powered aircraft, the thrust is derived from the equal and opposite reaction to the burning of the rocket propellant. In a sailplane, height attained by mechanical, orographic, or thermal techniques is translated into speed by means of gravity. Acting in continual opposition to thrust is a drag, which has two elements. Parasitic drag is that caused by form resistance due to shape. Skin friction, interference, and all other elements that are not contributing to lift-induced drag is that created as a result of the generation of lift. Parasitic drag rises as airspeed increases. For most flights, it is desirable to have all drag reduced to a minimum. And for this reason, considerable attention is given to streamlining the form of the aircraft by eliminating as much drag-inducing structure as possible. G. Enclosing the cockpit with a canopy, retracting the landing gear, using flush riveting and painting and polishing surfaces. Some less obvious elements of drag include the relative disposition and area of fuselage and wing. Engine. And empennage surfaces the intersection of wings and tail surfaces the unintentional leakage of air through the structure the use of excess air for cooling and the use of individual shapes that cause local airflow separation. Induced drag is caused by that element of the air deflected downward, which is not vertical to the flight path, but is tilted slightly rearward from it. As the angle of attack increases, so does drag at a critical point. The angle of attack can become so great that the airflow is broken over the upper surface of the wing and lift is lost while drag increases. This critical condition is termed the stall. Lift drag and stall are all variously affected by the shape of the wing platform. An elliptical wing like that used on the Supermarine Spitfire fighter of World War II. For example, while ideal aerodynamically in a subsonic aircraft has a more undesirable stall pattern than a simple rectangular wing, the aerodynamics of supersonic flight are complex. Air is compressible, and as speeds and altitudes increase, the speed of the air flowing over the aircraft begins to exceed the speed of the aircraft through the air. The speed at which this compressibility affects an aircraft is expressed as a ratio of the speed of the aircraft to the speed of sound, called the Mach number, in honor of the Austrian physicist Ernst Mach. The critical Mach number for an aircraft has been defined as that at which at some point in the aircraft the airflow has reached the speed of sound. A Mach number is in excess of the critical Mach number that is, speeds at which the airflow exceeds the speed of sound at local points on the airframe. There are significant changes in forces, pressures, and moments acting on the wing and fuselage caused by the formation of shock waves. One of the most important effects is a very large increase in drag as well as a reduction in lift. Initially, designers sought to reach higher critical Mach numbers by designing aircraft with very thin airflow sections for the wing and horizontal surfaces and by ensuring that the finest ratio length to diameter of the fuselage was as high as possible. Wing thickness ratios, the thickness of the wing divided by its width were about 14 to 18% on typical aircraft of the 100. And 94,045 period in later jets, the ratio was reduced to less than 5%. These techniques delayed the local airflow reaching Mach 1, permitting slightly higher critical Mach numbers for the aircraft. Independent studies in Germany and the United States showed that reaching the critical Mach could be delayed further by sweeping the wings back. Wing sweep was extremely important to the development of the German World War IA Messerschmitt Me 262. 
the first operational jet fighter, and to post-war fighters such as the North American F-86 Sabre and the Soviet Mi G-15, these fighters operated at high subsonic speeds. But the competitive pressures of development required aircraft that could operate at transonic and supersonic speeds. The power of jet engines with afterburners made these speeds technically possible, but designers were still handicapped by the huge rise in drag in the transonic area. The solution involved adding volume to the fuselage ahead of and behind the wing and reducing it near the wing and tail. To create a cross-sectional area that more nearly approximated the ideal area to limit transonic drag. Early applications of this rule resulted in a WASP waste appearance. Such as that of the Convair F-102 and later, JET's application of this rule is not as apparent in the aircraft's plan form. Devices for aerodynamic control in some flight conditions doesn't, preparing to land, landing, and after landing it is desirable to be able to increase drag to decelerate the aircraft. A number of devices have been designed to accomplish this. These include speed brakes, which are large flat plate areas that can be deployed by the pilot to increase drag dramatically and are most often found on military aircraft and spoilers which are surfaces that can be extended on the wing or fuselage to disrupt the airflow and create drag or to act in the same manner as ailerons. Drag can also be provided by an extension of the landing gear or, at the appropriate air speeds, deployment of the flaps and other lift devices. Lift and drag are roughly proportional to the wing area of an aircraft if all other factors remain the same and the wing area is doubled, both lift and drag will be doubled. Designers therefore attempt to minimize drag by keeping the wing area as small as possible, while enhancing lift with certain types of trailing edge flaps and leading edge slats, which have the ability to increase wing area mechanically. These devices also alter the camber of the wing, increasing both lift and drag. A passenger in an aft window seat of a modern airliner can observe the remarkable way in which the wing quite literally transforms itself from a smooth slim, streamlined surface into almost a half circle of surfaces by the deployment of a formidable array of lift and drag inducing devices. Flaps are extensions of the trailing edge of the wing and can be deflected downward as much as 4 to 5 degree. Many flaps effectively increase wing area, adding to lift and drag. The angle to which the flaps are deployed determines the relative amount of additional lift or drag obtained. At smaller angles, lift is typically increased over drag while at greater angles, drag is dramatically increased over lift. Flaps come in a wide variety of types, including the simple split flap, in which a hinge section of the undersurface of the trailing edge of the wing can be extended the Fowler flap, which extends the wing area by deploying on tracks, creating a slotted effect, and the Kuger flap, which is a leading edge flap often used in combination with Fowler or other trailing edge flaps. Various modern proprietary systems of multiple slotted flaps are used in conjunction with leading edge slats and flaps, all specially designed to suit the flight characteristics of the particular airplane. Leading edge flaps alter the camber of the wing and provide additional lift. Leading edge slats are small cambered airflow surfaces arranged near the leading edge of the wing to form a slot. Air flows through the slot and over the main wing, smoothing out the airflow over the wing and delaying the onset of the stall. Leading edge slots, which can be either fixed or deployable, are spanwise apertures that permit air to flow through a point behind the leading edge and like the slat, are designed to smooth out the airflow over the wing at higher angles of attack. The deployment of these devices can be varied to suit the desired flight regime. For takeoff and in the approach to landing, their deployment is generally to provide greater lift than drag. In flight or after touchdown, if rapid deceleration is desired, they can be deployed in a manner to greatly increase drag. Primary flight controls all four forces lift, thrust, drag, and weight interact continuously in flight and are in turn affected by such things as the torque effect of the propeller, centrifugal force in turns, and other elements, but all are made subject to the pilot by means of the controls. Elevator, Aileron and rudder controls the pilot controls the forces of flight and the aircraft's direction and attitude by means of flight controls. Conventional flight controls consist of a stick or wheel control column and rudder pedals, which control the movement of the elevator and ailerons and the rudder, respectively, through a system of cables or rods. 
In very sophisticated modern aircraft, there is no direct mechanical linkage between the pilot's controls and the control surfaces instead. They are actuated by electric motors. The catchphrase for this arrangement is fly-by-wire. In addition, in some large and fast aircraft, controls are boosted by hydraulically or electrically actuated systems. In both the fly-by-wire and boosted controls, the feel of the control reaction is fed back to the pilot by simulated means. In the conventional arrangement, the elevator, attached to the horizontal stabilizer, controls movement around the lateral axis and in effect controls the angle of attack. Forward movement of the control column lowers the elevator, depressing the nose and raising the tail backward pressure raises the elevator, raising the nose and lowering the tail. Many modern aircraft combine the elevator and stabilizer into a single control surface called the stabilator, which moves as an entity to control inputs. The ailerons are movable surfaces hinged to the trailing edge of each wing, which move in the opposite direction to control movement around the aircraft's longitudinal axis. If the pilot applies left pressure to the control column stick or wheel, the right aileron deflects downward and the left aileron deflects upward. The force of the airflow is altered by these control changes, causing the left wing to lower because of decreased lift and the right wing to rise because of increased lift. This differential in lift causes the aircraft to turn to the left. The rudder is a vertical surface and it controls movement around the aircraft's vertical axis. It does not cause the aircraft to turn instead, it counteracts the adverse yaw rotation around the vertical axis produced by the ailerons. The lowered wing has both decreased lift and decreased drag, the raised wing has both increased lift and increased drag. The added drag of the raised wing tries to pull the nose of the aircraft toward it I. E. Away from the direction of the turn. Pressure on the rudder is used to counter this adverse yaw. Because the turn results in a net decrease in lift, the application of elevator pressure is necessary. Thus, a turn is the result of the combined inputs of the ailerons, rudder, and elevator. Trim tabs are used by the pilot to relieve the requirement of maintaining continuous pressure on the controls. These are smaller surfaces inset into the rudder, elevator, and ailerons, which can be positioned by mechanical or electrical means and which, when positioned, Move the control surface to the desired trim position. Trimming the aircraft is a continual process with adjustments necessary for changes to the flight or power controls that result in changes in speed or attitude. Thrust controls the pilot controls thrust by adjustment of the control levers for the engine. In an aircraft with a reciprocating engine, these can consist of a throttle, Mixture control to control the ratio of fuel and air going to the engine, and propeller control as well as secondary devices such as supercharger controls or water alcohol injection. In a turbojet engine, the principal control is the throttle, with auxiliary devices such as water injection and afterburners. With water injection, a water alcohol mixture is injected into the combustion area to cool it, which allows more fuel to be burned. With afterburners, fuel is injected behind the combustion section and ignited to increase thrust greatly at the expense of high fuel consumption. The power delivered by reciprocating and jet engines is variously affected by airspeed and ambient air density temperature, humidity, and pressure, which must be taken into consideration when establishing power settings. In a turboprop engine, Power is typically set by first adjusting the propeller speed with the propeller lever and then adjusting fuel flow to obtain the desired torque power setting with the power lever. Propellers propellers are basically rotating airfoils and they vary in type, including two blade fixed pitch, four blade controllable variable pitch, and eight blade counter-rotating pitch. The blade angle on fixed pitch propellers is set for only one flight regime and this restriction limits their performance. Some fixed pitch propellers can be adjusted on the ground to improve performance in one part of the flight regime. Variable pitch propellers permit the pilot to adjust the pitch to suit the flight condition, using a low pitch for takeoff and a high pitch for cruising flight. Most modern aircraft have an automatic variable pitch propeller, which can be set to operate continuously in the most efficient mode for the flight regime. If an engine fails, most modern propellers can be feathered mechanically adjusted so that they present the blade edgewise to the line of flight, thereby reducing drag. In large piston engine aircraft, some propellers can be reversed after landing to shorten the landing run. 
Jet engines have thrust reversers, usually incorporating a noise suppression system to accomplish the same task. Instrumentation the pilot also has an array of instruments by which to check the condition of the flight, the engine, and other systems and equipment. In small private aircraft, the instrumentation is simple and may consist only of an altimeter to register height, an airspeed indicator, and a compass. The most modern commercial air transports. In contrast, have fully automated glass cockpits in which a tremendous array of information is continually presented on cathode ray tube displays of the aircraft's height, attitude, heading, speed, cabin pressure and temperature, route, fuel quantity and consumption, and the condition of the engines and the hydraulic, electrical, and electronic systems. These displays also provide readouts for both routine and emergency checklists. Aircraft are also provided with inertial guidance systems for automatic navigation from point to point, with continuous updating for changing weather conditions, beneficial winds, or other situations. Cockpits have become so automated that training emphasis is focused on resource management to assure that the crew members keep alert. And do not become complacent as their aircraft flies automatically from one point to the next. This array of instrumentation is supplemented by vastly improved meteorological forecasts, which reduce the hazard from weather, including such difficult to predict elements as wind shear and microburst. In addition, the availability of precise positioning from Earth orbiting satellites makes navigation a far more exact science. Sophisticated defogging and anti icing systems complement instrumentation for operation in adverse weather. Flight simulators, there are three factors that force the increased use of flight simulators in training the complexity of larger aircraft. The expense of their operation and the increased complexity of the air traffic control environment in which they operate. Modern simulators duplicate aircraft exactly in terms of cockpit size, layout, and equipment. They also duplicate the external environment and create a realistic sense of flying by means of the three-axis motion platform on which they are placed. Perhaps the most important use of flight simulators is to train crews in emergency situations so that they can experience first-hand situations that could not safely be demonstrated. In actual flight training, however, the simulator is also far less expensive than using actual aircraft for routine transition and proficiency training. So realistic is simulator training that airline crews are sometimes qualified on a new aircraft in a simulator prior to ever flying the aircraft itself. Types of aircraft, there are a number of ways to identify aircraft by type. The primary distinction is between those that are lighter than air and those that are heavier than air. Lighter than air aircraft such as balloons. Non-rigid airships, blimps, and dirigibles are designed to contain with their structure a sufficient volume that, when filled with a gas lighter than air heated air, hydrogen, or helium, displaces the surrounding ambient air and floats, just as a cork does on the water. Balloons are not steerable and drift with the wind. Non-rigid airships, which have enjoyed a rebirth of views and interest, do not have a rigid structure but have a defined aerodynamic shape, which contains cells filled with the lifting agent. They have a source of propulsion and can be controlled in all three axes of flight. Dirigibles are no longer in use, but they were lighter than aircraft with a rigid internal structure, which was usually very large, and they were capable of relatively high speeds. It proved impossible to construct dirigibles of sufficient strength to withstand routine operation under all weather conditions. And most suffered disaster, either breaking up in a storm, as with the U. S. Kraft Shenandoah, Akron, and Mackin, or through ignition of the hydrogen, as with the German Hindenburg in 1937. Heavier than air, this type of aircraft must have a power source to provide the thrust necessary to obtain lift. Simple heavier than aircraft include kites. These are usually a flat surface structure, often with a stabilizing tail, attached by a bridle to a string that is held in place on the ground. Lift is provided by the reaction of the string restrained surface to the wind. Another type of unmanned aircraft is the unmanned aerial vehicle UAV, commonly called drones or sometimes remotely piloted vehicles RPVS. These aircraft are radio controlled from the air or the ground and are used for scientific and military purposes. Unpowered manned heavier than air vehicles must be launched to obtain lift. These include hang gliders, gliders, and sailplanes. 
Hang gliders are aircraft of various configurations in which the pilot is suspended beneath the usually fabric wing to provide stability and control. They are normally launched from a high point. In the hands of an experienced pilot, hang gliders are capable of soaring using rising air columns to obtain upward gliding movement. Gliders are usually used for flight training and have the capability to fly reasonable distances when they are catapulted or towed into the air, but they lack the dynamic sophistication of sailplanes. These sophisticated, unpowered craft have wings of unusually high aspect ratio, that is, a long wingspan in proportion to wing width. Most sailplanes are towed to launch altitude, although some employ small, retractable auxiliary engines. They are able to use thermals currents more buoyant than the surrounding air, usually caused by higher temperature, and are a graphic lift to climb to higher altitudes and to glide for great distances. Orographic lift results from the mechanical effect of wind blowing against a terrain feature such as a cliff. The force of the wind is deflected upward by the face of the terrain, resulting in a rising current of air. Ultralights which were originally merely hang gliders adapted for power by the installation of small engines similar to those used in chainsaws, have matured into specially designed aircraft of very low weight and power but with flying qualities similar to conventional light aircraft. They are intended primarily for pleasure flying, although advanced models are now used for training, police patrol, and other work, including a proposed use in combat. Experimental craft have been designed to make use of human and solar power. These are very lightweight, sophisticated aircraft, designed with heavy reliance on computers and using the most modern materials. Paul McCready of Pasadena, California, U.S. was the leading exponent of the discipline he first achieved fame with the human-powered Gossamer Condor, which navigated a short course in 1977 two of his later designs, the human-powered Gossamer Albatross and the solar-powered Solar Challenger successfully crossed the English Channel. Others in the field have carried on MacReady's work and a human-powered helicopter has been flown. Solar-powered aircraft are similar to human power types, except that they use solar panels to convert the sun's energy directly to power an electric motor. Civil aircraft, all non-military planes, are civil aircraft. These include private and business planes and commercial airliners. Private aircraft are personal planes used for pleasure flying, often single-engine monoplanes with non-retractable landing gear. They can be very sophisticated, however, and may include such variants as warbirds, ex-military planes flown for reasons of nostalgia, ranging from primary trainers to large bombers homebuilt. Aircraft built from scratch or from kits by the owner and ranging from simple adaptations of Piper Cups to high speed, streamlined four-passenger transports antiques and classics. Restored older aircraft flown, like the Warbirds, for reasons of affection and nostalgia and aerobatic planes, designed to be highly maneuverable and to perform in air shows. Business aircraft are used to generate revenues for their owners and include everything from small single-engine aircraft used for pilot training or to transport small packages over short distances to four-engine executive jets that can span continents and oceans. Business plans are used by salespeople, prospectors, farmers, doctors, missionaries, and many others. Their primary purpose is to make the best use of top executives' time by freeing them from airline schedules and airport operations. They also serve as an executive perquisite and as a sophisticated inducement for potential customers. Other business aircraft include those used for agricultural operations. Traffic reporting, forest firefighting, medical evacuation, pipeline surveillance, freight hauling, and many other applications. One unfortunate but rapidly expanding segment of the business aircraft population is that which employs aircraft illegally for transporting narcotics and other illicit drugs. A wide variety of similar aircraft are used for specialized purposes, like the investigation of thunderstorms, hurricane tracking, aerodynamic research and development, engine testing high-altitude surveillance, advertising, and police work. Commercial airliners are used to haul passengers and freight on a scheduled basis between selected airports. They range in size from single-engine freight carriers to the Airbus A380 and in speed from below 200 miles per hour to supersonic. In the case of the Anglo-French Concorde, which was in service from 1976 to 2003, 
Aircraft configurations wingtypes aircraft can also be categorized by their configurations. One measure is the number of wings and the styles include monoplanes, with a single wing that is, on either side of the fuselage biplanes, with two wings, one atop the other and even, though rarely. Triplanes and quadplanes. A tandem wing craft has two wings, one placed forward of the other. The wing planform is the shape it forms when seen from above. Delta wings are formed in the shape of the Greek letter delta. They are triangular wings lying at roughly a right angle to the fuselage. The supersonic Concorde feature delta wings. Swept wings are angled, usually to the rear and often at an angle of about 35 degree. Forward swept wings also are used on some research craft. Some aircraft have wings that may be adjusted in flight to attach at various angles to the fuselage. These are called variable incidence wings. Variable geometry swing wings can vary the sweep by. E. The angle of a wing with respect to the plane perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the craft of their wings in flight. These two types have primarily military applications, as does the oblique wing in which the wing is attached at an angle of about 6 degree as an alternative to the standard symmetrical wing sweep. Another configuration limited to military craft is the so-called flying wing, a tailless craft having all its elements encompassed within the wing structure as in the Northrop B-2 bomber. Unlike the flying wing, the lifting body aircraft such as the U.S. Space shuttle generates lift in part or totally by the shape of the fuselage rather than the wing, which is severely reduced in size or altogether absent. Takeoff and landing gear Another means of categorizing aircraft is by the type of gear used for takeoff and landing. In a conventional aircraft, the gear consists of two primary wheels under the forward part of the fuselage and a tailwheel. The opposite configuration is called a tricycle gear with a single nose wheel and two main wheels farther back. An aircraft with two main undercarriage assemblies in the fuselage and wingtip protector wheels is said to have bicycle gear. Large aircraft, such as the Boeing 747, incorporate multiple bogey several wheels arranged in a variety of configurations in their landing gear to spread out the weight of the aircraft and to facilitate stowage after retraction in flight. A few aircraft use skis or other structures to allow takeoff from or landing in water. These include float planes, which are fitted with pontoons for operation on water flying boats, in which the fuselage also serves as a hull for water travel and amphibians, which are equipped to land on and take off from both land and water. The demands placed on naval planes used on aircraft carriers require a heavier structure to withstand the stresses of catapult launches and landings abruptly terminated by arresting gear. Landing gear mechanisms are also reinforced, and a tailhook is installed to engage the arresting gear, a system that is also used for land-based heavy military aircraft. The mode of takeoff and landing also differs among aircraft. Conventional craft gather speed to provide lift on an airfield prior to liftoff and land on a similar flat surface. A variety of means have been used in the design of aircraft intended to accomplish short takeoffs and landings STOL vehicles. These range from optimized design of the wing, fuselage, and landing gear as in the World War IF fuselage storage which featured handley page automatic slots, extendable flaps, and a long stroke undercarriage to the combination of generous wing area, large flap area, and the use of large propellers to direct airflow over the wing as in the pre-war crouch bolas or even such specialized innovations as large U-shaped channels in the wings as with the Custer Channel Wing aircraft. Vertical takeoff and landing VTOL vehicles include the helicopter, tilt rotors, and jump jets, which lift off from the ground in a vertical motion. Single stage to orbit SSTO aircraft can take off and land on conventional runways but can also be flown into an orbital flight path. Propulsion systems the engines used to provide thrust may be of several types. Reciprocating engines often, an internal combustion piston engine is used, especially for smaller planes. There are various types, based on the arrangement of the cylinders. Horizontally opposed engines employ four to six cylinders lying flat and array two or three on each side. In a radial engine, the cylinders ranging from five to as many as 28, depending on engine size are mounted in a circle around the crankshaft, sometimes in banks of two or more. Once the dominant piston engine type, radials are now in only limited production most new requirements are met by remanufacturing existing stock. 
four to eight cylinders may be a lined one behind the other in, an inline engine the cylinders may be upright or inverted, the inverted having the crankshaft above the cylinders. V-type inline engines with the cylinders arranged in banks of three, four, or six also are used. An early type of engine in which the propeller is affixed to the body of the cylinders, which rotate around a stationary crankshaft, is the rotary engine. Modern rotary engines are patterned after the Wankel principle of internal combustion engines. Automobiles and other small engines are modified for use in Humboldt and ultralight aircraft. These include two-stroke, rotary, and small versions of the conventional horizontally opposed type. Early in aviation history, most aircraft engines were liquid-cooled, first by water, then by a mixture of water and ethylene glycol, the air-cooled rotaries being an exception. After Charles Lindbergh's epic transatlantic flight in 1927, a trend began toward radial air-cooled engines for reasons of reliability. Simplicity and weight reduction, especially after streamlined cowlings covers surrounding aircraft engines were developed to smooth out airflow and aid cooling. Designers continued to use liquid-cooled engines when low frontal drag was an important consideration. Because of advances in engine cooling technology, there has emerged a minor trend to return to liquid-cooled engines for higher efficiency. Jet engines the gas turbine engine has almost completely replaced the reciprocating engine for aircraft propulsion. Jet engines derive thrust by ejecting the products of combustion in a jet at high speed. A turbine engine that passes all the air through the combustion chamber is called a turbojet. Because its basic design employs rotating rather than reciprocating parts, a turbojet is far simpler than a reciprocating engine of equivalent power, weighs less, is more reliable, requires less maintenance, and has a far greater potential for generating power. It consumes fuel at a faster rate, but the fuel is less expensive. In simplest terms, a jet engine ingests air, heats it, and ejects it at high speed. Thus in a turbojet, ambient air is taken in at the engine inlet induction. Compressed about 10 to 15 times in a compressor consisting of rotor and stator blades compression and introduced into a combustion chamber where igniters ignite the injected fuel combustion. The resulting combustion produces high temperatures on the order of 1,400 to 1,900 degree F 760 to 1,040 degree C. The expanding hot gases pass through a multi-stage turbine, which turns the air compressor through a coaxial shaft and then into a discharge nozzle, thereby producing thrust from the high-velocity stream of gases being ejected to the rear exhaust. A turbofan is a turbine engine having a large low-pressure fan ahead of the compressor section. The low-pressure air is allowed to bypass the compressor and turbine to mix with the jet stream, increasing the mass of accelerated air. This system of moving large volumes of air at a slower speed raises efficiency and cuts both fuel consumption and noise. A turboprop is a turbine engine connected by a reduction gearbox to a propeller. Turboprop engines are typically smaller and lighter than piston engines, produce more power, and burn more but cheaper fuel. Profins and ducted fan jet engines obtain ultra-high bypass airflow using wide cord propellers driven by the jet engine. Rockets are purely reactive engines, which usually use fuel and an oxidizing agent in combination. They are used primarily for research aircraft and as launch vehicles for spacecraft and satellites. A ramjet is an air-breathing engine that, after being accelerated to high speeds, acts like a turbojet without the need for a compressor or turbine. A scramjet supersonic combustion ramjet is an engine designed for speeds beyond Mach 6, which mixes fuel into air flowing through it at supersonic speeds it is intended for hypersonic aircraft. Engine placement aircraft types can also be characterized by the placement of their power plants. An aircraft with the engine and propeller facing the line of flight is called a tractor type if the engine and the propeller face opposite the line of flight, it is a pusher type. Both pusher propellers and canard surfaces were used on the right flyer these have now come back into vogue on a number of aircraft. Canards are forward control surfaces and serve to delay the onset of the stall. Some aircraft also have forward wings which provide lift and delay the stall, but these are not control surfaces and hence not canards. Jet engines are variously disposed of, but the most common arrangement is to have them placed underneath the wing and nasal suspended on pylons or placed on stub fixtures at the rear of the fuselage. 
Supersonic and hypersonic aircraft are usually designed with the engine as an integral part of the undersurface of the fuselage, while in some special military stealth applications. The engine is entirely submerged within the wing or fuselage structure. Materials and construction early technology for reasons of availability, low weight, and prior manufacturing experience, most early aircraft were of wood and fabric construction. At lower speeds than obtainable, streamlining was not a primary consideration and many wires, struts, braces, and other devices were used to provide the necessary structural strength. Preferred woods were relatively light and strong. G. Spruce and fabrics were normally linen or something similarly close-weaved, not canvas as is often stated. As speeds advanced, so did structural requirements, and designers analyzed individual aircraft parts for both strength and wind resistance. Bracing wires were given a streamlined shape, and some manufacturers began to make laminated wood fuselages of monoco construction stresses carried by the skin for greater strength. Better streamlining and lighter weight. The 1000. 912 record-setting French departison racers. The German Albatros fighters of World War I and the later American Lockheed Vigo were among the aircraft that used this type of construction. Aircraft made of wood and fabric were difficult to maintain and subject to rapid deterioration when left out in the elements. This, plus the need for greater strength, led to the use of metal in aircraft. The first general use was in World War I, when the Fokker Aircraft Company used welded steel tube fuselages and the Junkers Company made all metal aircraft of dual tubing and aluminum covering. During the period from 1000, 919 through 1000, 934, there was a gradual trend to all metal construction, with some aircraft having all metal almost always of aluminum or aluminum alloy structures with fabric covered surfaces and others using an all-metal monocle construction. Metal is stronger and more durable than fabric and wood, and as the necessary manufacturing skills were developed, its use enabled airplanes to be both lighter and easier to build. On the negative side, metal structures were subject to corrosion and metal fatigue, and new procedures were developed to protect against these hazards. A wide variety of aluminum alloys were developed and exotic metals like molybdenum and titanium were brought into use, especially in vehicles where extreme strength or extraordinary thermal resistance was a requirement. As aircraft were designed to operate at Mach 3 three times the speed of sound and beyond, a variety of techniques to avoid the effects of aerodynamic heating were introduced. These include the use of fuel in the tanks as a heat sink to absorb and dissipate the generated heat, as well as the employment of exotic materials such as advanced carbon-carbon composites. Silicon carbide ceramic coatings, titanium aluminum alloys, and titanium alloys reinforced with ceramic fibers. Additionally, some designs call for the circulation of very cold hydrogen gas through critical areas of aerodynamic heating. Current trends in aircraft design and construction while the basic principles of flight that the Wright brothers applied still pertain. There have been enormous changes over the years to the means by which those principles are understood and applied. The most pervasive and influential of these changes is the broad variety of applications of computer technology in all aspects of aviation. A second factor has been the widespread development of the use of composite materials in aircraft structures. While these two elements are the results of advances in engineering, they are also indirectly the product of changing social and legal considerations. The social issues are manifold and include the increasing global interdependence of business. The unprecedented political revolutions in every part of the world and the universal human desire for travel. In addition, concerns have grown about the environmental impact of airplanes, especially in regard to the burning of fuel and its contribution to global warming. All these issues come at a time when fuel prices have increased. As a result, both computers and composite materials are necessary to create lighter, stronger, safer, and more fuel-efficient aircraft. The legal issues are equally complex, but the purposes of this section revolve around two elements. The first of these is that the design. Testing and certification of an aircraft has become such an extraordinarily costly project that only the most well-funded companies can undertake the development of even relatively small aircraft. 
For larger aircraft, it is now common practice for several manufacturers, often from different countries, to ally themselves to underwrite a new design. This international cooperation was done most successfully first with the Anglo-French Concorde supersonic transport and has since been evident in a number of aircraft. A component of this process is the allocation of the production of certain elements of the aircraft in certain countries. As a quid pro quo for those countries not developing indigenous aircraft of a similar type. The second legal element is that the potential of very large damages being awarded as a result of liability in the event of a crash has forced most aircraft companies to cease the manufacture of smaller types of personal aircraft. The reason for this is that the exposure to damages from a large number of small single-engine planes is greater than the exposure from the equivalent market value of a few larger planes. Because the larger planes generally have better maintenance programs and more highly trained pilots. The practical effect of this has been an enormous growth in the home-built aircraft industry. Where ironically, the use of computers and composites have effected a revolution that has carried over to the commercial aircraft industry. Use of computers since the mid-1000. 960s. Computer technology has been continually developed to the point at which aircraft and engine designs can be simulated and tested in myriad variations under a full spectrum of environmental conditions prior to construction. As a result, practical consideration may be given to a series of aircraft configurations which, while occasionally and usually unsuccessfully attempted in the past, can now be used in production aircraft. These include forward swept wings, canard surfaces, blended body and wings, and the refinement of specialized airfoils wing, propeller, and turbine blade. With this goes a far more comprehensive understanding of structural requirements so that adequate strength can be maintained even as reductions are made in weight. Complementing and enhancing the results of the use of computers in design is the pervasive use of computers on board the aircraft itself. Computers are used to test and calibrate the aircraft's equipment so that, both before and during flight, potential problems can be anticipated and corrected. Whereas the first autopilots were devices that simply maintained an aircraft in straight and level flight, modern computers permit an autopilot system to guide an aircraft from takeoff to landing. Incorporating continuous adjustment for wind and weather conditions and ensuring that fuel consumption is minimized. In the most advanced instances, the role of the pilot has been changed from that of an individual who continuously controlled the aircraft in every phase of flight to a systems manager who oversees and directs the human and mechanical resources in the cockpit. The use of computers for design and in-flight control is synergistic, for more radical designs can be created when they are onboard computers to continuously adapt the controls to flight conditions. The degree of inherent stability formerly desired in an aircraft design called for the wing. Fuselage and empennage tail assembly of what came to be conventional size and configurations with their inherent weight and drag penalties. By using computers that can sense changes in flight conditions and make corrections hundreds and even thousands of times a second far faster and more accurately than any pilot's capability ability can be deliberately designed to be unstable. Wings can, if desired, be given a forward sweep and tail surfaces can be reduced in size to an absolute minimum or in a flying wing layout eliminated completely. Airfoils can be customized not only for a particular aircraft's wing or propeller, but also for particular points on those components. Use of composite materials, the use of composite materials. Similarly assisted in both design and application by the use of computers has grown from the occasional application for a non-structural party. G. A baggage compartment door to the construction of complete airframes. These materials have the additional advantage in military technology of having a low, observable stealth quality to radar. Some aircraft of composite materials began to appear in the late 1930s and 40s normally, these were plastic impregnated wood materials. The most famous and largest example of which is the Duramold construction of the 8-engine Hughes flying boat. A few production aircraft also used the Duramold construction materials and methods. During the late 1940s, interest developed in fiberglass materials, essentially fabrics made up of glass fibers. By the 1960s, enough materials and techniques had been developed to make more extensive use possible. 
The term composite for this method of construction indicates the use of different materials that provide strengths, lightweight, or other functional benefits when used in combination that they cannot provide when used separately. They usually consist of a fiber-reinforced resin matrix. The resin can be a vinyl ester, epoxy, or polyester, while the reinforcement might be any one of a variety of fibers, ranging from glass through carbon, boron, and a number of proprietary types. To these basic elements, strength is sometimes added by the addition of a core material, making an effect a structural sandwich. A core can be made up of a number of plastic foams, polystyrene, polyurethane, or others, wood, honeycombs, multicellular structures of paper, plastic, fabric, or metal, and other materials. The desired final shape. In terms of both external appearance and the internal structure required for adequate strength of a component made of composite materials can be arrived at by a variety of means. The simplest is the laying up of fiberglass sheets, much as is done in building a canoe, impregnating the sheets with the resin, and letting the resin cure. More sophisticated techniques involve fashioning the material into specific shapes by elaborate machinery. Some techniques require the use of male or female molds or both, while others employ vacuum bags that allow the pressure of the atmosphere to press the parts into the desired shape. The use of composite materials opened up whole new methods of construction and enabled engineers to create less expensive, lighter, and stronger parts of more streamlined shapes than had previously been feasible with wood or metal. Like the computer, the use of composites has spread rapidly throughout the industry and will be developed even further in the future. The coincident arrival of the new technology in computers and composite materials influenced commercial air transportation. Where aircraft larger than the Airbus A380 and faster than the Concorde are not only possible but inevitable. In the field of business aircraft, new technologies have resulted in a host of executive aircraft with the most modern characteristics. These include the uniquely configured Beach Starship, which is made almost entirely of composite materials, and the Piaggio Aveni, which also has a radical configuration and employs primarily metal construction but includes a significant amount of composite material. Commercial air transports are using composite materials in increasing amounts and may ultimately follow the pattern of the military services. Where large aircraft like the Northrop B-2 are made almost entirely of advanced composite materials. The previously mentioned legal considerations, combined with the advances in computers and composites, have completely revised the role of the Humboldt aircraft. While the Humboldt aircraft has always been a part of the aviation scene, the Wright Flyer was in fact a Humboldt. The designs were for years typically quite conventional, often using components from existing aircraft. Since the emergence of the Experimental Aircraft Association founded in 1953 in the United States, the Humboldt movement has operated in advance of the aviation industry, pioneering the use of computers and composites and especially radical configurations. While there are many practitioners in the field, one man, the American designer Burt Rutten, epitomized this transition of the Humboldt movement from backyard to leading edge status. Rutten of Mojave, California, had a long series of successful designs which reached the highest degree of recognition with the Voyager aircraft, in which his brother Dick Rutten and Gina Yeager made a memorable non-stop. Underfield flight around the world in 1,986 three other areas of civil aviation have benefited enormously from these advances in technology. The first of these is vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, including helicopters. The second are sailplanes, which have reached new levels in structural and aerodynamic refinement. The third is the wide variety of hang gliders and ultralight aircraft, as well as the smaller but more sophisticated aircraft that depend on human or solar power. Each of these has been vastly improved by contemporary advances in design and construction, and each holds great promise for the future.